ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. This is the wrong song.
Welcome, everyone. My name is Rabbi Michael White of Temple Sinai of Roslyn. And along with URJ board member Marilyn Yentis, I am honored to welcome you all to this historic forum where we will formally launch the Campaign for Youth Engagement. Today we come together as one movement to unite around a shared goal that by the year 2020, we will engage the vast majority of our youth and their families in vibrant Jewish life, embracing them and engaging them within community, enabling them to claim for themselves Jewish faith and tradition, and ensuring the vitality of the reformed Jewish community for this generation and generations to come. We know that the statistics on youth engagement will look different in Ottawa, or Texas, or New York, or Kansas. But we are one movement, and these are all our kids. So today, we begin with a sobering reality. North American Reform Synagogues engage only 20% of our youth through high school graduation. Let me say that again. By the senior year of high school, somewhere around 80% of our teens agree that maybe synagogue engagement is a nice thing to do if you can spare the time or have the money. But active participation in Jewish life is not obligatory, not necessary, not relevant, not meaningful, and not vital. How can those of us who devote so much of ourselves to Jewish life and who care so deeply for those teens and their families stand idly by in the face of the honest assessment that we lose the vast majority of our kids after they celebrate their B'nai Mitzvah? Like many of you, I worry that we are hemorrhaging our future. Today, we will explore this crucial problem through stories from the grassroots, both stories of anguish in the face of the current reality and the stories of hope in the possibility of what we can create together. We will turn to our texts and tradition for wisdom, and we will ask ourselves the hard question of whether our movement, specifically including the URJ, is doing all that is needed to fulfill our responsibility to our youth. This week's Parsha begins the story of the teenager Joseph, who is the most famous for his prophetic dreams. But Joseph's genius was not only that he dreamed great dreams, he was also an organization builder who, as an Egyptian official, saved the Middle East from starvation during the seven years of famine. Throughout history, at our best, we Reformed Jews have also been dreamers and builders. Today, we invite you to dream great dreams with us, and like Joseph, to build a new future for youth engagement and for the Reform Jewish world. We are honored to have with us our new president, Rabbi Rick Jacobs. And our senior vice president, Rabbi Jonah Pesner. And of course, our beloved Rabbi Eric Yaffe. They will share with us their vision and their commitment to go beyond mere, mere rhetoric, to create a sustained, excellent, fundamentally different approach to addressing the crisis of youth engagement. And now, to share the Campaign for Youth Engagement, I am honored to introduce Evan Trailer, an amazing teen leader from Oklahoma City. Hi.
Hi, I'm Evan Trailer. I was born and raised in Oklahoma City at Temple B'nai Israel. Oklahoma City is an interesting place to be Jewish. In many ways, growing up in a town with a small Jewish population has strengthened my desire to engage in Jewish life. Every time I think about the campaign for youth engagement, amazing memories pop into my head. Friendship circles at the end of Nifty Tour events, leading Havdalah for hundreds of Niftyites at Nifty Convention in Dallas, the beautiful sunset over Lake Jake at Green Family Camp, looking over the Negev Desert on my Nifty and Israel trip, and the lifelong relationships that I've created with all my temple, camp, and Nifty friends. I feel so blessed to have had all these experiences and to have these incredible people in my life. I wish every Jewish teen could have the memories that I've created and could experience the warmth, spirit, joy, and love that I find in Jewish life. Yet, we know that my experience is not the norm. I'm reminded that every time I talk to some of my own friends who left the Jewish community after their B'nai Mitzvah, all of us in every city, in every sector of the Reformed Jewish community have talked about it for years, and we've all, in our own separate ways, tried to find the solution to successful youth engagement. But things weren't really going to change until we committed to doing something big and doing it with all of us together. We knew we couldn't just look to a group of experts in New York City for a magic, instantaneous solution to this problem. We could draw on them for help, but they couldn't give us all of the answers. Instead, we needed to bring together every group that cared about this problem to work together as a team. The campaign for youth engagement brought together an innovative, diverse team with people of every age and from all over the country. People with important positions in the reform movement and people on the ground, just like me. The first thing our team needed to do was listen to the best experts, the people in our own communities who are living with this every day. That way we can investigate the roots of the problem, explore what youth engagement looks like when it works, and shared solutions and shared solutions that we could all be proud of because we all would have one hand in creating them. So we launched a campaign for youth engagement with a grassroots effort to engage in conversations throughout the reform movement with over 1,000 rabbis, teens, educators, parents, and so many other groups of people across North America. Last summer, I helped facilitate a number of these conversations as an avodah, staff in training, at the URJ Green Family Camp in Bruceville, Texas. We talked to campers from Texas and Oklahoma about their experiences of Jewish life. What is meaningful to them and what isn't? And why they find certain experiences more or less relevant? We encourage participants to tell us their stories, to share their own experiences. Conversations with these teenage campers revealed some amazing results and gave us new perspectives on what meaningful engagement is all about. One thing that really surprised me was how many kids who go to reform movement camps are not actively engaged in Jewish life during the school year. Even more, I learned that they would really like to be involved, but they are merely waiting for the right invitation and opportunity to join in. They are also looking to form meaningful relationships with peers and with adults, youth advisors, teachers, and clergy who can help create the same sense of belonging that they feel at camp. Those conversations gave us a good look at what it can look like if we come together to live out our dreams. After what I've seen and done, and after I've met and worked with such incredible, dedicated people, I feel certain that the future of Reform Judaism is in our hands. We will now hear from Marilyn Yentis, Rabbi Steve Fox, and Rob Lasky. Their stories are only three of the over 1,000 we've shared, but we heard similar stories hundreds of times over. Listen to see if you hear your story and the stories of people you care about in theirs. My name, as you know, is Marilyn Yentis. My story resembles many of yours. I grew up on the Jersey Shore, not the Jersey Shore of television fame, <laughs> but the Jersey Shore of another era, where being Jewish took as much effort as breathing. It was natural. It was easy. It was comfortable. Along the way, I met my husband, Paul, at college in North Carolina. Yeah. There, I learned that 
every place is not like New Jersey. In some communities where Jews are a distinct minority, living a Jewish life takes a concerted effort. I remember how each member of the North Carolina community was made to feel warm and welcome and, and important, values that stayed with me to this very day. Paul and I raised our three kids as he had grown up, active in a reformed congregation, attending religious school, going to Camp Harlem, and involved with NIFTY on the local, regional, and North American levels. I am proud today that Paul and I have both served as presidents of Temple Beth and May in Rockville, Maryland. And in addition to our ongoing commitment there, we are also active at Temple Bethel in Boca Raton, Florida. I am standing here today because I want my story, my Jewish journey to continue. I want my six gorgeous grandchildren to feel that Judaism is as natural as breathing and that they can find a welcoming and warm Jewish community wherever they choose to live but I am really concerned that that won't happen for them. Research tells us that if the current trends continue, approximately 80% of the children who become B'nai Mitzvah will have no connection of any kind to their synagogue by the time they reach 12th grade. When our family has Shabbat dinner at our home, I see that statistic hovering over the dining room table, and I am worried. Our world has changed since my own children were teenagers, and we have to change to meet my grandchildren's needs. Like many of you, I have spent my life building a strong and vibrant synagogue community. But I think we have come to the place in the life of our movement where what we are doing is not enough if we don't make drastic changes in the way we do things, we may lose my grandchildren and yours. And frankly, that would break my heart. I grew up in Orange County, California. Without conducting a scientific survey, I can imagine that in the early 1960s, there were more members of the John Birch Society than there were of the few synagogues in Orange County at that time. There were two reform. Our friend Rabbi Rick Jacobs was at the other one. Our relatively new congregation had what many of us would describe as a typical religious school. We attended for bar and bat mitzvah. We didn't care much for the classes, and we certainly didn't mind when we got in trouble and were sent outside. Then, in 1969, my older sister, now a rabbi in Los Angeles, told me that I was going to a youth group event. She said it was hosted by two regions, one called SCIFTI, the Southern California Federation of Temple Youth, and the other its counterpart in Northern California. She made it clear I had no choice. The day was organized by Rabbi Joseph Glazer, then a UAHC regional director, and later he held the position I now hold. Along with other kids from Southern California, we traveled to Santa Maria to support the United Farm Workers of America in their battle for recognition and for better working conditions for farm workers. Rabbi Glazer taught us that this social justice work was an integral part of Jewish life. I was hooked. Spending the day with other Jewish teenagers in support of the farm workers led to many other activities of a similar nature. Support for Soviet Jews, support for the McGovern Hatfield Amendment to end the war, all through NIFTY, all through youth group. The youth group became very important, and through their and their regional activities, I was exposed to prayer, tikkun olam, 
and certainly we can't diminish the great amount of fun we had. I built relationships with other teens and with my youth workers, including Rabbi Lenny Thal. Eventually, I became a regional president. This led to working at UAHC Camp Swig, first as a kitchen boy and then as program staff. These impressionable years in the Reform Youth Groups and at Camp Swig led to my decision to enter rabbinic school. Eventually, I came to understand the lessons of my youth group in new ways. Certainly, my own spiritual practices today are deeply rooted in the lessons of Rabbi Glazer. He taught us that we transform ourselves, and through that we are linked to transforming the world in which we live. In today's era, I fear, in fact, I know, that my children have not had the same experiences. When and if they show up, they and their friends don't develop the same kind of passion which we had. How this will affect the Jewish adults they will be, I don't know. Will that same fire, that same passion burn within? I worry that it will not. I cannot yet say the ways in which my kids will be committed to the Jewish community as adults, or what it will mean to future grandchildren. But it is clear, the reform movement must renew our work with youth. We must invest in multiple paths for the next generation to find meaningful Jewish life. The campaign for youth engagement must be effective, it must be engaging, and must be meaningful. The future of Jewish life, our children's future, is at stake. Thank you. Hello. My name is Rob Lasky. I'm 25 years old. I'm an industrial engineer for the United States Navy. I'm a grad student at Northwestern University. I'm a son. I'm a brother. Soon I will be a husband. I am Jewish. Being Jewish made me different than the other kids at school, but I didn't mind much. Through my family, I experienced what a wonderful thing being Jewish could be. My family lit Shabbat candles and went to services. We had seders and built our sukkah, and we ate uh, apples and honey every year. With them, I learned about community and tradition. My family is why I'm here today, and why I am and always will be Jewish. My family's shul had wonderful services. When I was a child, I shared in the services, the songs, and the traditions. But at some point, these things weren't enough for me anymore. I was young, and I was trying to figure out who I was. I started to reject those old conservative staples, my school, my parents, my temple. Most of my friends had quit being Jewish after their bar bat mitzvah. I showed up, but I was really just going through the motions. I was still Jewish, but the temple didn't represent my Judaism. The youth groups tried to reach out to me, but that connection was lost. The rest of the world had more to offer me. By college, I was completely removed from organized Jewish activity. Now I'm an adult, and I'm beginning my own family. I have an amazing fiancé and terrific friends. I love the people that I have surrounded myself with, the family that I've made for myself, but it just so happens that not a single one of them is Jewish. Because my fiancé isn't Jewish, it will probably be up to me to share my Judaism with my kids, but they won't have the same Jewish support structure that I had. I don't have the Jewish friends that can help share, with the, share the traditions with them, of Judaism. I'm scared that my children will be afraid to be different, and I don't know how to teach them to be proud that they are unique. My past is fast, but the, pu the future can be brighter. If we collaborate together to teach the old lessons in a new, innovative way, to make youth engagement a top priority, then the future, my children's future, can be different. That's why this campaign is important to me. Hi, I'm Cantor K. Greenwald, Cantor Emerita of Congregation Beth Am in Los Altos Hills, California, and immediate past president of the American Conference of Cantors. Wow. 
So let's take a moment to think about what we have just heard. The good, the bad, and the ugly. There was a lot of good in the stories we just heard. When I listened to Rabbi Fox talk about his youth group's trip to Santa Maria, or Rob's story about services at his shul when he was a kid, I had a big smile on my face. It reminded me of how precious and important Judaism can be to us and the immeasurable impact we can have on young people when we get it right. And yet, let's take a moment for self-reflection and think about what else we heard today. Try not to react, just listen. I never really liked religious school, and I hated the process of becoming bar mitzvah. It colored my feelings about Judaism forever. My kids are not turned on by Judaism the way I was. I am worried about their Jewish future. I am afraid that my grandchildren won't stay Jewish. I am afraid that Judaism will end with me. I am afraid. Does anything you heard feel familiar to you? I know that it feels familiar to me. My son is a freshman at UCLA. He was president of Beth Am Temple Youth. He was a Diller Teen Fellow. He has celebrated Shabbat nearly every Friday night of his life. But he has told me that he does not intend to get involved Jewishly in college. And as I watch him set his priorities, I wonder, will my grandchildren be Jewish? Truth. Most of us are failing in our most crucial task creating strong Jewish connections. I know you've heard this number a lot, but listen, the reality is that 80% of our youth don't stick around after they become bar or bat mitzvah. 80%. The good news is that some of them find other places to connect Jewishly. The bad news is that most, overwhelmingly, do not. And the ugly news is that they don't seem to be joining congregations or communities at all. We might want to blame our member families for not taking their kids' religious education seriously enough. We might want to fault our members for choosing soccer over Judaism on Saturday mornings. We might want to insist that our membership is not driven by bar or bat mitzvah. But what do we gain as a community when we blame those who opt out for opting out? Will that make us stronger? We can do something about this. This is not an insoluble problem. We are smart, well-educated, forward-thinking, and innovative. That is our heritage and that is who we are today. If we face the truth, truly face it, we can change it. The kernel of the solution is in the same stories we just heard. We don't need to blame our member families. We need to build relationships with them and engage with them. If we are talking to each other honestly and openly, then we can challenge each other and find the ways we need to work together to connect with that 80%. Let's talk again about Rabbi Fox's story. There is a lot to celebrate. People connected with him, first in an exciting trip to stand up for the farm workers, but then again and again, and worked with him to help him discover how meaningful and important his Judaism could be. Because of one moment in Nifty, we have before us today one of the world's leading rabbis, the chief executive of the CCAR. One small moment 
may have forever changed his life and thus the lives of literally thousands of people today. Blessings. Let's listen to Rob's insight. His Jewish commitment comes from his own family and his synagogue family, connecting with him and living Judaism with him. When those relationships dropped away, so did he. He knows he'll need those relationships, and we will need to build them for his future children if they are going to see what he saw. We know that wonderful moments like, this, like these occur in our reform movement every day. They remind us that we are fully capable of sharing our vibrant Judaism with generation after generation of young people. I am willing to bet that many of the people here in this room have a similar story to tell. How your interaction with a rabbi, an educator, a cantor, a temple board member, your WRJ sisters or MRJ brothers, a youth worker or a fellow congregant helped to move you deeper into your community, inspired you to get involved in Jewish living and learning. Abundant blessings. When the second temple fell, the entire world structure of our ancestors fell with it. One small rabbinic academy, led by Yohanan ben Zakkai, saved Judaism for the future by successfully transforming it into the rabbinic Judaism that we know. They were a community of vision, of strength, and of optimism. They took a great risk, but here we are today. Let their example be an inspiration to us. Let's join together, and by the year 2020, we will look back and say that through the campaign for youth engagement, we changed the Jewish world. As Evan Trailer taught us, relationships stand at the heart of the stories we heard from over 1,000 Reformed Jews to whom we spoke. Relationships, connections, community. These are great buzzwords, but what do they really mean? I'm Cantor Angela Bookdahl. I work at Central Synagogue in Manhattan. I was asked to teach a little on the Torah of relationships. I'm going to start with a story that might be familiar to you from the Talmud of a man named Honi, who came across a man planting a carob tree, an old man, and he scoffed at him and said, old man, don't you know you're never going to live to see the fruit of that tree? At which point he sat by the side of the road, ate a little lunch, and fell into sleep, a deep sleep. And when he woke up, he saw the grandson of the man eating from the fruit of the tree. Now, this is our Jewish Rip Van Winkle. He had overslept for 70 years. Now, this is usually where we stop the story on Tubishvat or whatever holiday we usually tell the Honi story. But the real story of Honi in the Talmud continues, and it has an even more radical and compelling message for us. After Honi wakens, he goes in search for his wife and his children, but of course, He's greatly saddened to see that they've died. But he does meet his grandson for the first time, who does not believe that Honi is indeed his grandfather coming back from a previous century. Then he went to the house of study, and he overheard the rabbi say, today's learning is as clear as it was in the days of Honi. And he jumped up and said, I am he. But none of them believed who he was. He became greatly distressed. Even though he still had family that was alive, even though his reputation had survived several generations, it didn't matter because no one recognized him for who he was. He cried out, O oh, Hevruta, O oh, Metuta, give me friendship or give me death. And then the story says, he died. Why? I'd like you to actually find a Hevruta, a friend, someone sitting right next to you and take one minute and ask each other, why did Honey die? Please, take a minute.
I'm sorry to cut off conversation, <clears throat> but since we're running a little behind schedule, I'm only giving you a therapist's minute. It's a little less than a minute. Okay. O hevruta o metuta. At first, this seems like preposterous hyperbole, friendship or death. But maybe in your discussion, you were able to begin to explore a little bit why it's not. What is it exactly about friendship that we know we need as much as we need water or air? Why is it that one of the only things proven to extend our lives as human beings is having a large circle of friends? And we know that in society, one of the greatest punishments we could ever give to someone is solitary confinement. By the way, if you've ever spent time with teenagers, I'm sure that they would relate to this, for they would rather die than give up their friends. We too know this truth, that without one friend who recognizes us for who we are, that we would die inside. So what exactly is friendship? We know this term can mean many things. Maimonides comes to teach us in Mishnah Avot. He quotes the very well-known line from Pirkei Avot, Ase lecha rav ukne lecha chaver. Make for, your friend, for yourself a teacher and acquire for yourself a friend. This comes to tell us two very important things about friendship. First, the language of acquiring is very deliberate. We are supposed to acquire a friend the way you would acquire anything that you think is of value, with our energy, our resources, our time. According to, to Maimonides, acquiring a friend is not just a Jewish motto. It is a Jewish obligation. Secondly, Maimonides teaches us that not all friendships are created equal. There are three levels of friendship. The first is a chaver tola'at, a friend of mutual benefit. These are people like a business partner, perhaps someone you took a class with, someone who lives in your building. I have 483 of these friends, as counted by Facebook. Now maybe these are the friends that you see in synagogue and you would probably wave to them in shul, maybe know them by name, you would even exchange pleasantries with them, talk about the weather or complain about the rabbi's sermon. These are a chaver tola'at. The next level of friend is a chaver hana'a, a friend of pleasure. Friends that you really enjoy spending time with, someone you would be willing to have over at your house for dinner, someone in your book group, someone that you actually trust to share your story with. These are the people in the Jewish community that maybe would come to your home for a shiva minyan, or perhaps someone that you see at synagogue and you get beyond the small talk. These are very good friends. And for some of us, our relationships in our lives, and certainly those of our relationships in synagogue, never get beyond that level. But there is a third level. A chaver le devar na'ale, a friend of ideals. This is a friend who shares your values, who loves you and pushes you to reach your highest self. These are the friends we need to be our best selves. This friend of ideals is the kind of friend that Maimonides says we are obligated to acquire. I want to honor a, a chaver le devar na'ale that was in my life my Jewish educator from Tacoma, Washington. Her name was Joan Garden. I grew up in this small, tight-knit synagogue. But in the 1970s, in Tacoma, I didn't really feel like I fit in in my Jewish community. I mean, look at me. In any case, when I was nine years old, an amazing song leader named Ruthie kind of swept into our town, and she started a a youth choir and it was amazing and I was singing Debbie's Sing Unto God at the top of my lungs everywhere I went and for the first time I felt like I had a language to fit in. I felt like I could contribute. But a few years later Ruthie got a better job offer in Chicago and she left and we had no more Jewish music in Tacoma. So I went to Joan to complain. How can this be? We need a music teacher. How can we not have Jewish music in our synagogue? And Joan said, okay, I'm looking. You know, Jewish music teachers don't grow on trees in Tacoma, Washington. But I kept asking. And at one point she looked at me and she said, Angela, you're right. Now you're very musical and you have a decent voice. 
I'll tell you what, I'm going to lend you my guitar and you're going to start learning how to play it and then I'm going to send you to Camp Swig this summer. They've got an eight week program and you're going to wash dishes. But you're going to learn how, <laughs> but you're going to learn as much Jewish music as you can in those eight weeks and you're going to come back and you're going to be our music teacher. Well that summer, it changed my life. I was 14 years old. I was a terrible song leader at first. I had my head buried in the shirenu. But she knew something that I didn't even know about myself. She, said, she could have said, oh, poor Angela, she doesn't fit in anymore. She could have just tried to fix the problem. But instead, she took me seriously as an essential member of my community. And this is what I became. Our synagogues must be places where we can work to acquire this highest level of friendship, the friends who help transform us and our world. We know this, and we call ourselves sacred communities, but we fall short. Our synagogues, like our larger culture, is very good at helping us build our Facebook profiles, but not so much these friends of ideals. So how are we going to be a place where we acquire friends of ideals? It won't just happen. I don't think I've figured it out, but if I have a little bit of hope, I'll share a glimpse from our last confirmation retreat and how it keeps me going. Based on what we learned from community organizing with just congregations, we decided to focus on real relationships at our last retreat. By creating an environment that was very safe, we asked our teens to take off their masks. We asked them about their fears, what they hide behind, and at first they were quite tentative, and this was certainly not business as usual. But as the first confirmation students began talking, I saw how hungry they were to share. One talked about his mom being diagnosed with cancer the last summer, and how he always wore a strong face, but didn't feel like he could share with anyone, especially his mother, how scared he was. Another one said, I don't know how to talk to my friends except through texting. And the last shared, the tremendous pressure he felt to succeed and admitted that he often looked for his own weaknesses in others so he could feel better about himself. Everyone spoke and there were tears and a level of intensity that we all felt. And afterwards they wouldn't stop talking and one said, I've never had this conversation anywhere else before. And one said, I've gone to school with all these kids since kindergarten but I never really knew who they were. We must be Jewish communities where we can work to acquire these friends of ideals. It changes everything. And if we create those friendships, we won't have to convince our teens to come back. They will never want to leave. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Stein. I'm a rabbi at Sharet Tefillah in New York City. 36 years of congregational experience since the day of my ordination. There is an underlying theme and issue at the heart of the struggle to successfully engage our youth. And this is it. Teens and parents cannot identify what is the value added to their lives from being Jews? If the synagogue means that it is a place for you, for your kid to celebrate a bar or bat mitzvah and have a party, why would you stay connected afterwards? Why would you stay when the last one in your family goes through this rite of passage? But, if, as Angela pointed out, the synagogue is a place where you see good friends, where people care about you, where you get to learn and grow and give back and stay connected, then the choice will be obvious. This afternoon, we're here confronting an uncomfortable truth. We never really had that 80% to begin with. I know from my years in the rabbinate that it is relationships and community that keep people involved and connected. 
If we are not in relationship with our youth and families, if we do not give them the space to talk about who they really are, what they feel, what matters to them, they will continue to walk away in droves. And we have decades of evidence to prove that that's the case, including my own congregation. We have about 70 B'nai Mitzvah a year. Last year, I had a confirmation class of seven. We need a new bottom line for measuring success. It's not enough to count how many people walk through the doors and participate in our programs. We need to ask ourselves, when they leave, have they been touched and inspired? Do they feel connected and cared for? Did they have an opportunity to, to discover a new relevance of Judaism? to their life. This is the moment that we begin to put relationship and connection at the center, and if we do, that revolving B'nai Mitzvah door will stand open and each person will refuse to walk out but stay in. So what would it look like? I want to give you a few examples first. I suggest that we not measure our success only by how many people walk in the door. That's only part of our goal. We need to touch people where their lives matter most and where they spend most of their time, and that means outside of the synagogue, outside of our buildings. Real success involves giving them Jewish, li Jewish lives that transcend their time in our sanctuaries, classrooms, and social halls. And we need to convince our movement that it is time to reach out to the unaffiliated and not penalize young people whose parents do not choose membership in our synagogues. Second, I see a need for a paradigm shift away from counting success as how many kids come to confirmation and toward how many kids stay connected after Bar and Bat Mitzvah. Confirmation has become our movement's teen idol. When I sit with rabbinic colleagues and we talk about our retention rate, what we mean is how many kids stay in religious school and confirmation. We shouldn't get rid of it. It is an, a uniquely reform innovation and experiment. It is central to our understanding of emerging adolescence and into adulthood. But we need confirmation to be a goal, not the goal. And we need to give teens credit for every and any way that they stay connected post B'nai Mitzvah. We need to move confirmation to 12th grade. We need to make confirmation a real goal and not another potential exit moment. Third, Seventh grade is too late to engage our young people and families. From the very beginning, we need people to know that we care about them, and we need to welcome them not only when they come to the new member tour. That is why this is the campaign for youth engagement, not teen engagement. We focus not only on our teens, but the whole family beginning in early childhood. If we make that initial investment, then we will be able to rely on the strength of ongoing relationships to ensure that there is a seamless and continuous journey for our families and youth from their earliest stages into adulthood and parenthood. Fourth. 
Prioritizing relationships means we have to be serious about how staff and volunteers spend their time. If one-on-one -on -one relationships with clergy, with youth professionals, teachers, camp counselors, board members, volunteers, and mentors are, is really the way to keep our youth connected, then we need to count success one student at a time, one camper at a time, one teaching assistant at a time, one parent at a time. You never know who will be the next Steve Fox or Rick Jacobs. You never know what influence you have on an individual who comes into contact with you in a Jewish context. You never know who will be the next Cantor or early childhood director or URJ president. So we need to count our staff and volunteer time spending building one-on-one -on -one relationships as a primary necessity for how we understand our roles. And finally, while there are many examples of how this paradigm shift might work out in our congregations, I want to address one of the hardest. We all know that in too many of our congregations, including my own, 90% or more of the people who show up on Shabbat morning are the invited guests. As a result, congregational rabbis and cantors have a different community every Shabbat service. Many of our congregations struggle to keep the focus on God rather than worshiping the bar bat mitzvah student. As a result, Shabbat in many congregations has become a private moment for that week's B'nai Mitzvah family and their guests. The privatization of B'nai Mitzvah, selling tutoring in the open marketplace, holding services in country clubs and hotels, this does not bode well for the future of a Jewish community. B'nai Mitzvah is one of the most important places that the Campaign for Youth Engagement can assert the importance of relationship, community, and connection, and it is one of the most important things that we will face together as a movement, and we were led by Rabbi Yaffe's Shabbat morning speech in San Diego a few years ago. You know your congregations and your communities the best. I encourage you to think about these ideas and to place connection and relationship at the center of your congregational culture. Take this home and wrestle. Wrestle along with everyone here and synagogues like yours all across the country. And now it's my pleasure to invite Allison Kerr, the Executive Director of Jewish Living in Wellesley, Massachusetts, and a member of the visioning team of CYE. Thank you, Rabbi Stein. Your vision is truly inspiring, but we know it will require challenging, time-consuming work. Yet congregations do not have to go it alone. In fact, to be most successful in engaging youth and their families, congregations can't go it alone. Avra Basov, a Nifty Board Vice President and Vision Team member, identified three words to help us frame this conversation. People, partnerships, and pathways. Let's start with people. If we are serious about building relationships with youth and their parents, then we have got to start with the people who are on the front lines with our youth. Think for a minute. Who is the person who got you engaged? Who was there when you needed them? Behind most of us who love Jewish life are relationships with incredible youth volunteers, youth advisors, rabbis, cantors, camp counselors, and teachers. Yet many of these staff stay around only for a short time. Inevitably, after a few years, they leave to go back to school or to look for a more upwardly mobile position. Right now, in my congregation, we have an educator, Brett Lubarski, who has formed the deepest relationships with our teens and has had a huge impact on, the sense, on their sense of connection. 
I am racking my brains to figure out how to hold on to him after he graduates. We must elevate the status, status of youth workers by offering training, connecting them to professional networks, and establishing long-term career paths. We can... We cannot be complacent about a system that attracts great, talented people who build relationships with our kids only to watch them leave every two years. So that's people, and now on to partnerships. We know that immersive experiences are among the most effective youth engagement strategies we have. Day schools, early childhood centers, camping, Israel trips. Too often, however, we see these experiences as someone else's responsibility outside the congregation instead of what they really are, opportunities for deep, transformative experiences for our youth. Imagine what it might look like if camps and synagogues collaborated to address teen leadership, spirituality, and worship. If JCC early childhood programs partnered with synagogues who don't have preschools, if day schools worked with congregations to share their expertise in faculty development, if federations who see the big picture supported all of this work. In my congregation, we're just beginning to build such partnerships. Six years ago, only five TBE kids went to our URJ camps, and two of them were mine. At the time, the Greater Boston Federation and the Foundation for Jewish Camp were launching the One Happy Camper Initiative, one-time <laughs> one -time tuition grants for first-time campers. We jumped on it. We created a plan and a strategy to increase the number of our kids going to Jewish summer camp. We took advantage of the fact that many of our staff work at Eisner and Crane Lake camps. This <laughs> This synergy enabled us to establish regular camp visits by staff and clergy, a broad promotional campaign, an annual Shabbat celebrating our Jewish campers, and participation in the Camp Ambassador Program. And it really worked. This summer, we sent 60 kids to Eisner and Crane Lake camps. Now, with so many campers in our synagogue, we have stronger relationships, spirit-filled tefillah, and increased participation in our Nifty Youth Group. We are now ready to think about other strategic partnerships with our local Reform Day School, our JCC, perhaps even other congregations, to expand opportunity for family and youth, and youth that will enhance our cong congregational community. We are learning that our greatest competition is not other Jewish institutions or programs. It's indifference. There's no limit to the variety of partnerships we can build that will strengthen our kids' Jewish lives. We are so pleased to have with us today representatives from the New York and Greater Boston Federations, BBYO, Jesna, United Synagogue, the Jim Joseph Foundation, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, and the Harold Grinspoon Foundation. We look... We look forward to continuing to learn from you and to pursue our shared goals together. Okay, so we've got people and we've got partnerships. Now, what pathways will we pave? There is no one-size-fits-all Jewish journey. There are so many points of transition in Jewish life. Transitions from experience to experience and transitions based on age and life stage. Our research taught us that at each one of these transition points, we lose people. Think about your own pathway. When was it interrupted? When was it smooth? We need seamless, not sporadic engagement. We must help congregants connect diverse experiences and create Jewish journeys filled with joy, meaning, and relationship. We have the responsibility to help people make connections person to person, experience to experience, community to community. One moment that calls out for partnership is when our children go off to college. How do we help our youth transition from home and the structure of synagogue, youth group, and camp 
to college and new levels of choice and independence. Hillel struggles with this question every day. It is my pleasure now to invite Wayne Firestone, President of Hillel, to join our discussion. Okay, so I'm hoping at some point we're going to get some images behind me that in the interest of time, and because I'm a visual learner, I'm hoping you'll appreciate at this stage of, of the program. The partnership between Hillel and URJ is one we're very proud of, and one that didn't just exist to be uh, on this stage tonight. For the past year, your leadership has prioritized what I would call a period of tsimsum, that we would go inside and we would learn from each other. And we have learned a great deal, and it's going to help in this pledge for the youth to come up with something smart. We did not negotiate arm's length agreements. We did what Jews can and should do and have done for thousands of years when we're smart about it. We hug each other with our arms. We embrace each other. We learn from each other and we listen to one another. That's the kind of Jewish community that our students, our young people can understand and that's the kind of partnership that URJ and Hillel are going to forge into the future for many years. Can I get the image? Okay, a few minutes about Hillel. This and the Meshuganas at the Simpsons is the first impression that many get of a Hillel on campus. It's about the building, it's about the boys coming out, it's about the prayer books. And it is true, we actually have a lot of nice facilities, as you do, and we're proud of them, and they're terrific on the one hand. In the past five years, we've actually put up 25 new facilities on university campuses around the country. I mentioned that at a board meeting last week and rhetorically asked, can anybody think of any other institution in this country that has opened 25 facilities in the past five years? And of course, some Meshuggah raises his hand and says, yeah, prisons. <laughs> now, our real estate actually happens to be at Stanford and at the University of Virginia and at Muhlenberg and at the University of Wisconsin and in places that we know it's worth investing with a partner, and our partner is the university, and we could not have done this in the past five years if it wasn't for them actually investing in Jewish life. Now, next slide. Many of you know us from over the years, from different periods of history, and I won't go through them, but what I want to share is whatever your personal connection with Hillel is, either through a building, through an educator, through a prayer service, whatever that is, I need, you to, that was, I need you to put that to the side for the moment so that I can describe to you what we've learned over the past five years at Hillel and that we've been sharing with our colleagues at the URJ because we did a strategic plan where like many of the speakers before you heard, we did the hardest thing, the hardest thing we looked in the mirror and we were honest with ourselves. We said, here, yes, we love to celebrate. Yes, we have many accomplishments. Yes, there are many tuchuses that are warm in the seats that we provide. But what about everybody else? And in doing so, today, six years later, we are a much stronger organization, a much stronger movement, and we are in a better place. So that is what this, the few minutes that I'm going to have will share what we actually learned from this. Next slide. You heard a call to think outside of the building, think outside of our current structures. We created something that cost us actually very little, and we learned a lot from, frankly, some of the resources that you provided us from your students from camp and otherwise. We learned that one of the really most powerful drivers for young leadership was the Jewish camp counselor. And I just came from a lunch where we talked about what that looks like if we thought about it as a horizontal pipeline of talent moving into college and then from college beyond college afterwards for young adults. Thinking about that, we went to 10 campuses and with the wonderful vision and foresight of the Jim Joseph Foundation, we said, you know what, let's pilot this first and let's not do it just in New York City. Let's do it in Kansas and in Texas and in other parts of the country and on small private colleges as well as big state universities and Ivies. 
And over the past four years, we tried out a pilot that basically said, what if we think of the students as assets and use them to be the peer engagers to build social networks around the people that they know in the business clubs, in the fraternities, in the sororities, in the acapella clubs, on the tennis team, in all the different places that we found student leaders. But instead of calling them counselors, we call them interns. And we pay them, and we recruit them, and we train them, and we evaluate them, and we supervise them in the same way that a successful counselor program works. And from that, what we learned is they have very powerful networks to get all the students that are going to walk by the Hillel building and never step foot inside that we and our staffs and our educators could never get to. And once their peers socially have engaged them and defined them and we come to them, most of our activity today is taking place outside the building and in some cases not even with the Hillel brand. So that is the kind of risk taking that it's going to require in order to take on the strategy that you've developed. And I very much applaud you for taking that risk. Next slide. So we're, if we're not going to count tuchuses, as you just heard, what are we going to count? How are we going to measure our success? So we looked at four very specific elements to define set success. Positive Jewish memories, Jewish knowledge, people and community experiences. And the short version of this is three out of four of those are actually pretty easy. Our students are studying microeconomics and astrophysics and they're acing it and they're in demand by all the top employers in the country. They can actually understand a thing or two about our Jewish knowledge. The hardest one, Jewish self-confidence. And self-confidence as a general model for young adult is difficult. So that's the one that we need to work on. But when you bring a Jewish role model and a Jewish educator who comes from a non-judgmental judgmental background, who's not asking them how much they've learned, but asking them who they want to be and how they can grow as Jews and as human beings, that's the way that we can show that the Jewish community is valuable to, valuable to them. Last slide. Now that, you're going to have to wait till tomorrow. Next slide. Okay. Here is where we get to meet your students as a general matter, and here is where I think we need to give some thoughts about transitions. We take for granted that our kids graduate from high school and we give them a nice uh, ceremony and party when they graduate and we uh, quell when they get their acceptance letters. Now a lot of them are going to come electronically. But nonetheless, we know that there is an opportunity to think about movement in terms of the Hebrew root of the word, tnuah. Movement relates to ideology and a certain approach to doing things, but the very same Hebrew letters describe the phenomenon of movement, of actual physical movement. And we know as students move from high school into college and from then college into young adulthood, they are physically moving and need new strategies and approaches. My last thought to leave you with is an idea that we got from an unlikely place, Southwest Airlines. Anybody fly Southwest Airlines at, either to this conference or any time recently? They have something called the Office Officer of First Impressions. We decided to create an office, and I think together we need to create an office of second impressions. Because no matter what the prior experience of the 80% or whatever percent that we look at, we know as young adults they will form their identities and new opinions and valuations in new ways. And that present, presents us a tremendous opportunity to reintroduce them to a Jewish heritage and tradition that is one that they can be proud of. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to call forward our new Union for Reform Judaism President, Rabbi Rick Jacobs. We hope that your mind is buzzing with ideas from the thoughtful and creative possibilities laid out before us by our speakers. 
but we all know that great ideas are not enough. We all know that pat slogans and nice words are not enough. Rabbi Jacobs, today we glimpse the national cry for action from teens and parents and grandparents, from lay and professional leadership all across our movement, all begun with 35 rabbis from across this country, inspired by Rabbi Paul Yedwab, who came together to challenge the URJ and to advocate for youth, demanding leadership, demanding sustained energetic commi commitment, all with one voice, to make youth engagement the next revolution in reformed Jewish life. So I ask you, are you prepared as you ascend to national leadership? He made the same look in the rehearsal, too. <laughs> as our fourth president, as you begin to work to set priorities and vision to make the campaign for youth engagement your number one priority. I, Rick Jacobs, do solemnly swear There's been a lot of truth spoken today. There are a lot of dreams articulated. I want to hold up a mirror right now. I want to tell some truths about what it will mean to get this done. I'm, I'm not surprised to imagine that there are a few people sitting in the, in the community today who are thinking, how in the world are we going to change what needs to be changed to make this happen? It all sounds, first of all, it sounds essential, but is it doable? So let me say that there are literally challenges and opportunities wherever I look, and there are a million things we need to do. But I'm standing here today, and I'm going to tell you that if we don't do this youth engagement right, the rest of it is not going to matter. I'm absolutely certain if we do this campaign for youth engagement the way we've done a lot of things, it's not going to make a difference. So we're going to tell the truth today about what's broken, and there's a lot that's broken. We're going to tell the truth today about what's at stake, and there is a lot at stake. And we're going to tell the truth today about how we are going to get from here to there. And it's not by following the road signs that are already in place. You listen to Wayne Firestone, they're not doing Hillel the way it was when I was in college, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> the de-nerdification of Hillel, that's what we're trying to do. We didn't get there. And we're not going to do this if we think it's only what happens outside of our synagogues. This has to be what's happening in our synagogues has got to go through a transformation. And we've got to get outside the walls of our synagogue. We've got to connect everything together and we got to do it with strength and creativity and honesty and evaluation and passion. And then we'll do it. So let's move to the who are we in, who are we in this room today? Do we have the strength in this room today to take those first concrete steps to move down the path? We do have in this room what we need. We have the big ideas. We have the truth. We have the yearning of the soul to touch our youth, to touch our communities, to build communities of meaning and purpose and depth. And to find the right way to measure this success, we will know when we plant the seeds that we have envisioned today. So I want to say, if we're serious about youth engagement, we're going to have to put some money to this. It's not going to happen just by wishing. So let me say the beginning of our commitment. Over the, past, over the past year, the URJ has raised more than $700,000 designated exclusively to supporting congregations' efforts to bring the Campaign for Youth Engagement home. That deserves your applause. Got more. Don't, don't, don't give up. We're just getting started. The women of Reform Judaism have continued their historic leadership on youth engagement by pledging $90,000 to this campaign. 
We've got some great partners here. We're going to get many more. The Jim Joseph Foundation, with the leadership of URJ trustee and Vision Team member Jerry Somers, has contributed $25,000 and just committed to give another $50,000. And now I'd like to call forward Rabbi Eric Yaffe, Sam Simon, and Rabbi Larry Berkowitz to announce additional special gifts. They're going to make sure that we're going to move forward and we're going to get this done with strength and with dedication and commitment. Many of us have the good fortune of knowing Rabbi Richard Sternberger, who joined the URJ, then the UAHC, uh, in 1967 as the Assistant Director of the New York Federation of Reform Synagogues. Rabbi Sternberger later became Regional Director of our Mid-Atlantic Council. As many of you know, Dick Sternberger passed away in January of last year. Our friends Sam Simon and Rabbi Larry Berkowitz are here to make an announcement and presentation in Rabbi Sternberger's memory. Thank you, Eric. It is our honor and privilege as dear friends of Dick Sternberger to be here with you today. As you know, Sternberger was born in Philadelphia, attended the University of Pennsylvania, majored in philosophy, graduated at Phi Beta Kappa, and then joined the Hebrew Union College. During his career, he served as a chaplain in the Navy and continued as a reserve officer for 30 years. He served in Korea. In the summer of 1964, he went down to Mississippi, this urbane, very gentle person, to help register black voters. We talked about it a great deal. He and I became very close friends. He was a champion, not only a supporter, a champion of civil rights. He testified in Congress before Congressman Hyde for women's rights, and he was so passionate, as he always was, that Congressman Hyde turned his back on him, but he spoke anyway. He was very proud of that. He marched in Washington for civil rights, he was a champion of civil rights and a champion for human dignity. In 1970, he was appointed the regional director of the Mid-Atlantic region. He told me he knew everybody in the region except me. He thought I was some stuffy European guy. Well, for 30 years, we became close friends. We became chosen chosen brothers for each other. He um, was a legendary regional director, respected and loved for his work and for his profound commitment. He was a major force in Nifty. He sent young people to HUC very proud of it, too. And he was a passionate believer in Jewish camping. To me, Dick Sternberg is described best by a saying by, of Rabbi Meir, who said, he who engages in the study of Torah for its own sake merits many things. And I love the three descriptions of this person that really applies to Dick very, very well. He was a rea ahuv, a beloved friend. He didn't have acquaintances, he had friends. He was a very profound thinker, theologian, philosopher. Ohevet Hamakom, on that basis, he was a lover of God. And above all, essentially, Dick was a champion for human rights, for human dignity. He was Ohevet Habiot, a lover of mankind, a passionate defender of Judaism, and a wonderful representative of the Union in the region, beloved and respected. 
And now I would like to introduce our past president of Rodef Shalom, Sam Simon, who has a wonderful gift to present in behalf of Rabbi Sternberger's estate to the campaign for youth engagement, and we know it will help. <clears throat> Rabbi Alfi, Rabbi Jacobs, Marilyn, my pleasure as not just the executor of his estate, but as a deep and long friend of Rabbi Sternberger's. It is my honor and privilege to present on his, this check for $300,000. to fulfill Dick's promise and in his memory for the campaign for youth engagement. Thank you, Sam and Larry. Thanks to you. Most of all, thanks to Dick Sternberger for this extraordinary gift. Thank you. It's now my honor to call forward Mark and Marie Schwartz to announce another special gift. I had the privilege of knowing and helping to connect the Schwartz family, their boys, Eric and Ben, and they were members of Westchester Reformed Temple in Scarsdale, and we sent them off with blessing and love to another great Reformed congregation in Boston. It's a privilege to introduce Mark and Marie Schwartz. We've had the pleasure of, of saying that we've heard a lot of challenges tonight about the, or this afternoon, about the 80%. Well, thanks to Rabbi Jacobs, and when we moved to Boston, thanks to Rabbi Pesner, um, our sons have kind of been in the 20%. Uh, they both continued through very active programs, both in college today, but won't hesitate to email Rabbi Pesner to say, hey, I need a fun congregation to go to. I, I need a different, um, congregation to go to for High Holy Day services, can you suggest a rabbi? Um, I should say as college students too, they don't hesitate to take Passover Seder literally and make sure they drink every glass of wine. But that's another way of getting our college students involved. But we realize the importance, it's leaders like Rabbi Jacobs and, and Rabbi Pesner and a lot of the people uh, from whom you've heard this morning, today rather, talk about, you know, it's, it's those dynamic leaders that keep our youth engaged. And so what we'd like to announce is that on behalf of a dear friend of mine, uh, John Chevelle, who I grew up with um, from the time we were in kindergarten, we actually spent a lot of uh, enjoyable times in synagogue youth and different youth groups. And this is someone who grew up to be a very successful executive in a trucking company, New England Motor Freight, that his family owns in New Jersey. John unfortunately passed away about two years ago. Um, but, and he died without any children of his own, but it was always a very special friend to our children, to um, my nieces and nephews, and to any children in need, including and in dividing the entire Ronald McDonald House in New York over to his apartment to have parties for kids in need. And so in honor of John, who also felt very strongly about uh, youth engagement and Jewish education, um, where we've committed $250,000 from his estate. <laughs> to kick off this program. Um, but this is just a start with the wonderful gift we just heard. Um, with this gift, we really want to encourage others in the audience to think about helping us because this is really a critical thing for our children, for the next generation, and without dynamic innovative programs, without dynamic innovative leaders, we're not going to get this done. So please join us, um, think about how we go out and get other gifts and really kick this off. Thank you. Thank you. We are so honored to work with you to honor the memory of your friend and his deep commitment to teens. We've raised a total of just over $720,000 just to seed the campaign for youth engagement. Let's hear a round of applause for that. 
Mr. Chair. Wait, I have another announcement to make. As we pass along the torch to Rabbi Jacobs, it's essential that he succeeds and that the union succeeds and that this campaign succeeds. So for that reason, I want to take that 720,000, add to it, get the number right, $337,124 in funds raised as a tribute to me on my retirement. We now have a capacity to invest over $1 million in our youth. Almost done, hang in there. I know we're a tiny bit late, but this last part is really key because the only way we're going to get this done is when we literally gather up all of the stakeholders, all the people who are going to stand with us, all the people who are going to move this from a great idea now to the beginning of funding, to the inspiration that will change the way we engage with our youth, not just with programs, but creating at the core deep relationships, the things that sustained our ancestors in the Tanakh in the Talmud throughout Jewish history, that connection that will make us strong and deep and filled with the blessings of our tradition. I want to call forward the leadership of each of our partners. And when I do, I want you to come stand up. It's not an accident that I want you to stand up. Stand up for our youth. Stand up for the future that we're beginning to imagine. Stand up for the future we will create. Let me begin, begin with Nifty. The North American... 120 Nifty Teens are here at our forum today. Let me ask the president of Nifty Forest Yesness, please come and stand. The American Conference of Canners, Canner Susan Carroll, president, please stand. The Central Conference of American Rabbis, Rabbi Jonathan Stein, President, Rabbi Steve Fox, Chief Executive, come stand for our youth. Early Childhood Educators of Reform Judaism, Tammy Venner, President, please stand. <clears throat> Hillel Foundation, Wayne Firestone, President, CEO, come stand for our youth. Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, Erwin Engelman, Chair of our Board of Governors, come stand for our youth. Pardes, Day Schools of Reform Judaism, William Norman, Chair, please stand. Men of Reform Judaism, the Honorable Ira B. Warshawski, President, stand please. National Association of Temple Administrators, Livia Thompson, President, please stand. Nate, National Association of Temple Educators, Lisa Lieberman Barzilai, President, please stand. The newly launched Reform Youth Professionals Association, which will soon become an affiliate of our union, Barrett Haar, stand. For the Union of Reform Judaism, Bill Blumstein, please come stand for our youth. Almost last, but certainly not least, because of their long history of commitment to youth, the Women of Reform Judaism, Lynn Mag Lazar, President, please stand. <laughs> Representing the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, Rabbi Gary Zola, who will offer blessings and give us the sacred grounding that's going to allow us to move forward with strength. Just look at that site. Look at the leadership of our movement. And if, if you are here today and your leader is standing in front of us, would you stand up in the forum right now? And if you're not standing, but you believe that the future of our movement, the future of our people depends on getting this right, would you stand with us today?
Stay standing, open your minds, open your imaginations, Rabbi Gary Zola. Let us bring this wonderful show of unity and support for the future to a conclusion with a lesson from the North American Jewish experience. Sam Levinson, a comedian, when I was a teenager in Nifty, used to tell stories about his immigrant father. He said his immigrant father came to this North American continent because he believed the streets were paved with gold. But when he got here, he discovered three things. First, the streets of North America were not paved with gold. Second, the streets of North America were not paved. <laughs> and third, his father was the man who was expected to do the paving. As we now resolve to leave this place, let us remember that it is up to all of us, together in unity and in harmony, to pave the road for a golden future. On this hope, we recite with the words of the psalmist, Vayehino am Adonai Eloheinu aleinu uma aseyadeinu konana aleinu uma aseyadeinu konanehu. May the favor of the Eternal One be upon us, and let the work of our hands prosper. O oh, prosper together the work of our hands, and we say, Amen. Amen. Give us five more minutes. Can we have five more minutes? Can we have five more minutes for youth? Are we rolling a video? Are we rolling a video or not? You guys got five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. No video. Where's my nifty friends? If you're a nifty, will you stand up? You see these people shouting here? These are, oh, now, we got the video. This is my campaign. 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 Adults can provide us with inspiring situations to follow our dreams. Reform Judaism is important to me because it allows me to meet Jews from all over the world and to break out of my shell. During my freshman year, I stopped all Jewish activities and I never thought I'd be involved again. If it weren't for the existence of Nifty, I would still be not doing anything Jewish. Reform Judaism is very important to me as it has given me a really strong moral and ethical center around which I can base all my actions in life. Adults can get youth more involved in Judaism by bestowing tradition in their family and in their everyday lives. Adults can help, help us by getting to know us. I really appreciate the connections we share as a faith and Reform Judaism, I think, helps to build that. Being a Reform Jewish teen is important to me because it's allowed me to become an independent thinker and a leader and an adult, and I wish it for everyone in the world. I believe adults can help um, kids in youth group by teaching them how to be strong in temple life. My campaign is uh, getting adults to help teens change the world uh, by recognizing our potential and the potential of our peers to be amazing. This is my campaign. 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 My friends, we just heard the voices of our young people say to us, this is my campaign, this is our campaign, is this your campaign? So I'm asking you now, is this your campaign? Is this your campaign? If this is your campaign, then I would ask you to join with us 
because the URJ is with you. You are not alone. All that money we are raising and will continue to raise is not for the URJ in New York. It is for you and what you are going to build on the ground. In the months ahead, we will announce the innovation grants where we'll ask you to innovate and to experiment locally. Let us fund your work as you discover how to build pathways for young people. And we guarantee you, we know that within a year, we will have a full, robust cohort of 19 full-time professionals in every nifty region in North America. And I want to introduce you to my Hevruta, Rabbi Bradley Solmson, the next Director of Youth Engagement for the Union for Reform Judaism. I was called to accept this position. I'm not referring to the phone calls I got from Rabbi Pesner and Rabbi Jacobs. I was called to work with teens. I want to spend two seconds to talk to the members of NIFTY who are here today. To the members of NIFTY, I was called to work with you and for you. We have a tremendous amount of work to do together to rebuild, to reconnect, to re-establish relationships with you and with your friends in that 80% we heard of. Many, many of the adults here today think you have a tremendous amount to benefit from reconnecting to your Judaism. I know that you have a tremendous amount to contribute to the Jewish community. We need to grow. We need your help. We need to be challenged. We need to be questioned. We need your voices with us. I feel called to partner with you to help you reshape the Jewish community with us. I can't wait to get started. In a whisper now, in a whisper, are you ready with me? This is my campaign. 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 Take hands now. This is my campaign. This is my campaign. Hevruta Umatuta, stand up, Hevruta. This is our campaign. This is our campaign. Chazak, Chazak, let us go forward together. Amen. And the old shall dream dreams. And the youth shall see visions, and our hopes shall rise up to the sky. We must live for today, we must build for tomorrow. Give us time, give us strength, give us love. Today's the day I take a stand. Today's the day I take my stand. Dreams from days of old. I have to make the way for generations come and go. I have to teach them what I've learned so they will come to know that the old shall be dreams and the youth shall see visions and our hope. everybody for being here. I have two very brief housekeeping, housekeeping announcements. 
Those who are joining us in the Education Summit poster session can proceed to Prince George Exhibit Hall E, E as in excellent. And those members of the campaign vision team are invited to please meet together in Potomac 1 immediately following this.